but we'll get started. So our theme speaker today is Roger Dannenbo from Carnegie Mellon, and he is professor of computing science in he is professor of computing science, art, and music. And uh, Roger is unquestionably a pioneer in the field of computer music. He holds multiple patents, uh, as many music students will know. Uh, I discovered, I don't think I realized this, he's one of the main developers, or was a main developer of Audacity, which anybody who does anything in acoustics will. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, this is something all our students use. Um, and he's also a trumpet player and a performer. And so today he's going to talk to us about music understanding and the future of music performance. So I will get off and let you get started. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you all. And, and I want to thank uh, Mike and, and the university uh, for having me here. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, I, might, I might mention, well, I don't know, it's a little late, but the, the uh, uh, occasion of, of my being in Edinburgh is I've had a robot, robotic bagpipe player installed at the Scottish Parliament for the last several months. So I don't know if anyone saw it or heard about it, but it's part of the exhibit about uh, Andrew Carnegie and, and his legacy, which includes Carnegie Mellon University, uh, along with uh, Andy Warhol, who was uh, a student at Carnegie Mellon. And so at the Parliament, there, there's an exhibit of, of Warhol paintings. Uh, there's some very interesting stuff about Andrew Carnegie. And uh, sort of representing the university, there's a robotic bagpipe player that and combines the technology and Scottish heritage. Um, the reason I said it's a little late is on Thursday uh, we're dismantling the, uh, the robot and packing it up and that's, I'm, I'm here to take it back home. Uh, but, but the exhibit with the Warhols and the uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie uh, exhibit is, will, will still be up for a while. So uh, I, I found it, even coming from Pittsburgh, I found it really interesting uh, when I saw it. Okay, so I may be preaching to the converted, but let's start uh, just uh, asking, you know, why computers and music? <coughs> uh, music exists in every human society, and uh, computers, especially these days, are readily available just everywhere. Uh, and uh, they're available to extend our music-making abilities. So I think it's very natural to try to uh, integrate ubiquitous computing with the ubiquity of music in society and see if we can use computers to make music more fun, more available, higher quality, more personal. So this is really my, my vision and my goal is to uh, uh, work on um, uh, discovering what we can do with computers and music. And I, I'd like to say just a couple words about my background. I was always interested in math and music and making things. I've uh, been a trumpet player uh, for a long time. And I, I discovered synth both synthesizers and computers in high school. And to me, it just seemed natural to, you know, I'd already been playing music. I was already interested in uh, math. And, and the idea that you could sort of make things like software to do math uh, that could be related to music. To me, that was just a, a natural combination. And I discovered, in, really in college, that uh, other people had already thought of that. <laughs> and there was, there was work going on. And, uh, uh, but anyway, I was really hooked. And throughout my career, uh, the research that I've done has always been motivated by my musical experience. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about a lot of these things, and you'll see um, a lot of uh, uh, performance-related research and a lot of uh, trumpet playing and a lot of uh, uh, things that were you know, derived from my musical experience. And, and I think that's uh, uh, always a good thing when, when you can uh, try to do research that's really grounded in, in real life experience. So that's a quick introduction, and what I want to do today is uh, very briefly talk about how computers are already in widespread use in music, uh, which will be no surprise. And then I'd like to talk about uh, research that I've done uh, in the past, so that will be kind of computer music present, 
and then speculate wildly about computer music of the future. So how is computation used in music today? Uh, I would uh, say that there are four main areas, and those are kind of represented by these pictures of music production, musical instruments, music distribution, and music uh, search and recommendation. And so uh, just to go through those four very quickly, uh, music production. So first of all, all music today, or nearly all music today, is recorded digitally to disc. It's manipulated uh, digitally uh, in order to do equalization, mixing, reverberation, editing, all kinds of production steps. And, and music is digitally transferred to digital media for distribution. So the entire chain of production these days is all digital. And while it used to be that production was, was done with special purpose hardware, you know, there'd be dedicated high-speed DSP reverberators and other you know, mixing units and all sorts of hardware and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, even in you know, the most uh, professional settings, everything is essentially done on personal computers. A uh, similar trend is happening with musical instruments. Of course, there are, we still have lots of acoustic instruments and uh, violins are hardly being replaced by uh, computers in, in or at least in orchestral performance. But uh, electronic instruments like keyboards have followed the same uh, path of starting with very specialized analog hardware, moving to specialized digital hardware, and now <coughs> most uh, synthesizers, even when they look like they're special purpose hardware, like they look like this, this picture up here, actually embedded inside is a computer and everything is, is really based on software. Um, and so there are all kinds of interesting instruments and controllers out there that are all uh, digital and computer software based. Uh, music distribution, I probably don't need to tell anyone that uh, you know the, the days of analog phonograph records are, are long gone. There's actually been kind of a resurgence. Uh, it's kind of interesting to follow follow that. But uh, anyway, for the for the main distribution of music, it's all digital and and the compact disc sales or in other words kind of the specialized hardware is declining and the software is on the rise. Just uh, downloading and decoding compressed audio files is how we distribute music these days. And then finally the fourth area is music recommendation, music search. Um, just in the last 10 years or so we've seen many new online systems out there for uh, finding music that's similar, from using things like collaborative filtering to recommend music. Uh, we have music fingerprinting uh, that allows people to, if they're listening to something they're interested in and they don't know what it is, you can uh, use your cell phone audio to capture that music, send it to a server somewhere, and it will uh, look up in a database of on the order of 20 million songs and very quickly identify what you're listening to and tell you what it is and probably offer to sell it to you. So that's uh, something, a very, very big change has happened in the last decade or so. Uh, so that's, I think that pretty much summarizes the uh, use of computing in music in the popular sphere. But there's a lot of stuff that's a lot more uh, less lesser known uh, is happening in, in uh, art music practice, it's happening in research labs, and I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to focus on my own work, but uh, so let's, let's talk about the stuff that's, you know, the stuff that's been done but hasn't really seen a wide uh, audience yet. And I have a number of examples, again this is drawn from my work, so we'll talk about computer <coughs> accompaniment, style classification, score alignment, onset detection, and sound synthesis. And I will start with uh, kind of where I got started in computer music research. This is, and you'll, you'll see some very old equipment in this 
this video, but I think it's, it's still fun to watch. Uh, this is uh, about computer accompaniment. Creation of a computer accompaniment system. I'm going to begin by loading the file into the program. The file contains a score, and in the score, there's a part that I'm going to play on trumpet that's also displayed on the screen. There's another part, which is an accompaniment part, in this case, composed quite some time ago. The purpose of the program, then, is to listen to my performance, a live performance of the solo part, and to synchronize the other parts and, and play them along with me. The other thing that's uh, kind of, I think, interesting about this work is 
that this matching, knowing where you are in the score, is treated as a more or less independent <coughs> process from how to play an accompaniment musically. You don't want the accompaniment to exactly follow uh, the performer uh, because you know there are going to be discrepancies, and a good accompanist will kind of accommodate the performer by by musically adjusting. And so we use a rule-based system that has rules like if the matcher is confident about the position and the accompaniment is ahead but less than a tenth of a second, then just stop until you're synchronized uh, with the performer and then continue. On the other hand, if the uh, matcher is confident and the accompaniment is uh, behind uh, but less than half a second then speed up until synchronized. And uh, so this, with, with enough rules, and, and not too many rules, you know, 10 rules or so is enough to cover most of the, the really bad, unmusical things that could happen. So an example of something bad would be if, if the accompaniment discovered it was two or three seconds behind the music, and like a computer, it said, oh, I can catch up really fast. <laughs> and, then, and then we're there. That would sound very unmusical, and so we don't do that. We have, you know, take another path. Uh, okay, so this computer accompaniment stuff turns out to work very well and be very robust for instruments with keys and valves, like uh, trumpets, brass, and woodwinds. And it's not turns out not to be so great for voice, because voices uh, produce tone continuously. Singers do not make instantaneous pitch transitions from one note to another. They tend to kind of uh, gliss or portamento. And then there's vibrato that can be very wide. So pitch is very indefinite, and maybe even more than pitch, actual note onsets. Knowing where the notes are is very difficult with vocal performance. And so if your whole matching algorithm is based on matching sequences of notes, and you don't even know where the notes are, you can imagine that, that using a system like I showed for voice would not work very well. So uh, one of my students, Lauren Grubb, did his PhD thesis on vocal accompaniment. And he developed a whole set of new techniques. He was uh, the first to look at this problem in a probabilistic way. So that instead of saying, you know, either, either there's a note and it matches or there's a note and it doesn't match, which is a very discrete decision, he could make a, a more continuous decision of, well, maybe, maybe it's a note, maybe not, and we have this continuous probability to talk about it. And he also introduced the idea of machine learning to learn from actual performances what all the parameters should be in this statistical model. Uh, so I have some output from this. Uh, this is uh, obviously a human singer. She's singing into a microphone, which is the on only input to a computer. Uh, the piano that you hear is being played by a computer uh, with, with, no, with just the microphone input and obviously <coughs> the score for the piece, which includes the vocal part and a piano part. And, uh, the singer is intentionally speeding up and slowing down. It's not nearly as dramatic as the trumpet example that I gave, uh, but if you listen closely, you'll, you'll hear her sort of pushing and holding back, and you'll hear the computer can adjust to it.
high level description of what's going on here. Uh, the, the main thing is that uh, underlying all of this, the model is that score position is continuous and we can model what the computer knows about score position as a probability density function. So rather than have saying, okay, the position is at one particular place, we have a continuum of places it could be with different probabilities. And uh, you hope if the computer is actually following the vocalist that there will be a big peak uh, somewhere that, that says, okay, this is, this is where we really think uh, the performer is. But while you're tracking this peak, other hypotheses might arise, like, you know, there's some evidence that we're actually back here and some evidence that we're here. And, um, you know, these, these lower peaks might, if they turn out to be correct with more evidence, they'll actually overcome the, uh, the one that you're currently assuming. And the way this works is uh, a very uh, kind of straightforward, classical uh, Bayesian approach where we have the, a prior, this, you can think of this as being prior probability and we're updating it every 30 or 50 milliseconds. And uh, we, we update it by saying, well, first of all, we know that score position is always increasing and we have some estimate of tempo. So we can slide the, the graph over to the right and we can smear it out a little bit because of uncertainty. And, and then we can look at observations uh, which let's assume it's just pitch for now. And so if you're um, observing, in other words, your pitch detector says I hear a G, then everywhere in the score where there's a G is going to have a higher likelihood and every place there's not a G will be lower. Any place there's a G sharp, it's not going to be as low as if there's a, a, a because it's, it's only off by a half step, um, probably going to be much more likely to be where there's a C-sharp written in the score. And so you compute all these, all these probabilities and Bayes' rule tells us how to do updates. And uh, we, so we're constantly updating this uh, probability density function. And that's how we follow the, the singer. Uh, I wanted to show you one more example. So in the, in the 90s, uh, a company at the time called Vivace and now called Company is Make Music, uh, created, uh, well, licensed this uh, technology from Carnegie Mellon and uh, created a product for education. I like to show this because it's, you know, it's a real world application. Uh, whoops. So that it can hear even your most subtle tempo changes as you sing or play. Then its patented technology determines the most musically satisfying way to follow. Finally, it plays the accompaniment accurately and in the appropriate style. Now all of this is happening so fast you feel like you're playing with a very good human accompanist. To demonstrate this, Chisato will play the second movement of Preston's Sonata. follows extremely well. How closely Vivace follows you is determined by its intelligent accompaniment percentage. Now this can vary throughout a piece. You can even turn the intelligent accompaniment off if you want to and just play along with Vivace's default tempos. In addition to following your tempos, Vivace will also wait for you more appropriately. If you hold a note extra long or pause before starting a phrase, Vivace will allow you to do so because it's listening to you. Cynthia will demonstrate just how responsive Vivaji can be with Samuel Barber's daisies. And of course, 
simply as free to sing daisies in a completely different way. As a trumpet player, you know who could resist having Wynton Marcellus uh, hawking your your wares? But um, they're they're uh, 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 they've updated the product many times. Uh, it's now it's a completely software-based uh, product. There are about 200,000 students, I think, uh, using or you know or licensees of, of this. And there's been maybe not uh, extensive research, but at least some research saying that. that Students that practice music with accompaniment um, are, are better players, and they enjoy it more, and they practice more. I think all those things are related, so I'm, I'm very happy with that. When, uh, I, when I used to show this computer accompaniment work, people would always ask me, what happens if you improvise instead of playing, you know, sticking to the score? And the answer there was always, uh, not very interesting, you know, that if you don't play the score, nothing matches, the computer doesn't know what to do, pretty much you can either keep playing and ignoring you, or you can just stop, depending on what you want it to do, but neither of those is interesting. Uh, but being an improviser, those questions always kind of stuck in my mind and made me think, well, what, what would it mean for a computer to interact with a jazz musician? You know, what, what, what do musicians you know, what is there in music that improvisers could, uh, um, could understand or that a computer could understand? And uh, one thing is that when musicians are, are improvising and playing, they sort of expect one another to understand what's going on. So if I'm playing, uh, uh, if I'm playing trumpet and I'm playing a jazz solo and I'm, and I'm playing louder and higher and faster, you know, I don't want the, the drums to just chill out and relax. I want the drummer to get more energetic and reinforce what I'm doing. And, and uh, there are a lot of different styles that I can play. And it seems like other, I expect other musicians to understand that. So we started thinking, what if, what if we could make computers actually understand uh, in, improvisational style? And this led to uh, this program. Uh, so this is um, uh, a real-time style classifier that's listening to my improvisation and putting up uh, its best guess up on the screen. So this is, this is happening, the analysis is done over a five second window, and so sometimes there's well, as much as a five second latency before the, the correct decision is, is made. And uh, one interesting thing about this is you might say, you know, how can you, how do I know if this thing works? And, and how do I know, you know, what is uh, syncopated or not syncopated, what's, what's lyrical, what does pointillistic mean? Um, well, it turns out that you can actually uh, uh, treat this as, uh, as all you know, meaningful. And, and the way that we did this is we had uh, uh, me or some other musician uh, 
play, well, first of all, come up with a number of, of styles. So the terms, you know, there's no absolute definition for these terms, but they're just imagine that you ask a musician to write down four or five or ten uh, styles and with names that that, that musician can, can reproduce. And uh, so then, then you um, train this, you get examples of all of those things and you train the system. And then, uh, to evaluate the system, what you do is um, put up on the screen a random choice of one of these styles and say, okay, I want you to play that style and we're going to see what the computer comes up with. And if the computer comes up with a matching <coughs> style, then you know that regardless of what that word actually means or how it, anyone interprets it, at least you are able to put that word into the musician, the musician generated music, the music was recognized and the same word came out the other end. So there had to be information and actual, you know, correct classification going on. The way we do that is uh, we extract a number of features from the audio, like note density, mean and standard deviation of the pitch range, uh, mean and standard deviation of pitches and intervals, and, and many more, and we compute these features over five second windows and we do use very, what are today very standard uh, classifiers, machine learning classifiers like Naive Bayes, linear classifiers, neural networks, and um, we have a paper that, that does this and compares different learning algorithms, and, uh, but, um, but all of them actually work, work quite well. Um, okay. Let's move on to another uh, topic. Another capability that we've worked on is polyphonic audio to score alignment. So this is this problem is can can we get a computer to listen to audio? So here's you know represented in the top here and follow along in a score like like this down here. And so actually we're gonna we're not so much worried about. Uh, optically recognizing the score, but suppose we feed in a machine-readable version of this score, a bunch of discrete symbols and data, uh, can the computer match it up with audio? And so that sounds a lot like these computer accompaniment problems, but now we're talking about perhaps listening to a full orchestra or uh, a full pop recording or something like that. And uh, this is an example this is the output from one of the first things we tried. And, oh, and this is work that I did with Ming Hu. And you'll hear her name uh, in the next couple of examples. So this is a Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, first movement. And this vertical axis represents time in the acoustic recording. And here's time in a symbolic uh, MIDI file representation. And first of all, you'll notice the acoustic recording is a lot slower. It, it lasts 450 something seconds, whereas the MIDI was 350 something seconds, so a lot faster. And, uh, but you'd sort of hope that the output would be more or less a diagonal line, saying that uh, you know, as we linearly progress through the MIDI file, we linearly progress through the acoustic recording. And, um, but it's not a perfect diagonal line. And a couple of features you can, might be able to see is up here, the, uh, we reach the end of the MIDI before we reach the end of the audio. And the reason for that is the audio uh, was recorded in a concert hall with a lot of reverberation, and they didn't get to the last note and just cut off the recording. It actually goes for uh, five extra seconds or so. And so there's a little, uh, you know, that extra delay is up here. So that's. That was kind of confirming that all right, the program wasn't just drawing a diagonal line, it actually figured something out. And the other thing that happens is if, if you sort of see a little glitch in the alignment right here. And when I saw that, I, I, um, I thought I knew what was going on, and I really hoped, but I, uh, Nate brought this to me and I said, hey, I think you better go find out what that glitch is, because either the program is doing something really good or something really bad. Uh, we need to find out what it is. Does anyone offhand, does anyone know what that is? Um, there will be holes in there. Sorry? Holes. Um, yeah, it's like a pause, but so, 
Does anyone know where, where there's something pause like in first movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony? Uh, okay, well, here I'll, I'll play it for you. You might recognize it. So just to be clear, this is the symphony, there's bum 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 bum. Alright, it's that it's that big thing. But right in the middle, Beethoven just says, let's have an oboe cadenza. It's actually not right in the middle. It's you know, I, I, I studied composition with Paul Cooper and he liked to point out all the occurrences of the golden mean in composition. So I haven't actually measured it, but two thirds, you know, we're right around the golden mean and, and something magical happens. So I don't know if that was who knows. Uh, but anyway, so if we go and listen to the MIDI version of this, in the MIDI version, the, you know, the notation was just played by a computer with, with no, uh, it was put together with no special interpretation, so here's what it does. So it turns out that was... Uh, even though all of the MIDI is faster than the audio, this was, e you know, even relatively, it was, it was faster than the... Uh, I guess the... Oh, I think that was the Philadelphia Orchestra, and whoever the oboist was, I think he... <laughs> that was his big moment, so <laughs> he made the most of it. Uh, anyway, so that's score alignment. Uh, there is a version of Audacity that can do score alignment, and I'm uh, sad to say that we don't have it in the, the, the main release and maybe it will get back in there. Uh, there were just to do uh, to get score alignment we had to have better ways of getting MIDI in and that meant we needed a better MIDI interface and then we thought well we better be able to play MIDI and so there were so many changes to the system there were a lot of uh, concerns about releasing uh, a whole bunch of stuff without further testing. But anyway this this shows you one thing you can do with this alignment if you were, for example, if you were editing uh, some orchestral music, and this is Haydn's Symphony Number no. 94, I believe. Yeah, um, you know, it's kind of hard to see what's going on in the audio. You see long sections just like this. It's just kind of a, a big blur. But if you align that with with MIDI, you can see. Oh, well, maybe that's. I, I see a bunch of short notes, and I see this. Uh, melodic run going up and then these sort of uh, arpeggiated things coming down and or, or a, I guess a chord outline coming down and, and here's a, a you know, orchestral 2D right here and so you can see a lot of things that you don't see in the music it might help uh, make editing easier. Another problem that I've worked on is finding note onset. So note, a note onset just means the beginning of the note. And you would think note onsets would be really easy because the naive model of a note is you have this you know, big loud attack and the note decays away and you have another big attack. So all you have to do is look for the big sudden increases in amplitude and that's where the notes are. But if you look at real data, well first of all, you know, look at this orchestra. There's hardly anything in there that looks like that model. Uh, if you look at a single instrument, this again, this is a trumpet, uh, but it's typical. You see all kinds of little variations in amplitude. It turns out these these little peaks here are just vibrato; they're not new notes. Uh, there are this this big rise here is not an onset. The onset's actually back here at time zero, and also. In between notes, if your model is that the sound goes to zero and then it starts again, that's just not true at all. Here's, uh, well, it's kind of compressed in this picture, but there's this, the sound between these two notes never goes to zero. And in fact, it, the amplitude, the continuous amplitude across these notes is higher than the loudest portion of a softly played note. And so there's, there's no simple threshold that will tell you where, where notes begin and end. Um, so uh, we have, and again, this is work with Ning Hu, uh, we developed some new techniques based on machine learning where we use score alignment to actually produce a lot of data that we can use as training data. 
and then we um, so we, we then train a computer to recognize onsets based on a lot of audio features like uh, the pitch stability, what's happening in the upper harmonics, um, of course what's happen happening with amplitude, what's happening with zero crossings, all kinds of, of features and computers have a, and machine learning give us a way of integrating all these features typically much better than you could ever write by hand. And uh, this is, I want to just play the output of that, of our onset detector on some trumpet input that we trained on. And so. Okay, so what you're hearing is obviously trumpet uh, with some clicks or some uh, kind of woodblock sound behind it. So those woodblock sounds are the computer detected note onsets. And the thing that's striking to me about this, and I guess you have to compare with other work, is just how temporally accurate uh, those woodblock sounds are. I, I had actually played my trumpet through a lot of other you know, pitch to MIDI devices and things like that, and I was always frustrated by how arrhythmic the output was, and I always thought it was just me. And then when I, when I hear this, it's almost like a drummer. Um, uh, Playing these wood blocks, but these, are, you know, it's actually my my attacks that controls the timing. Um, whoops. All right, from the beginning, I guess. Expressive musical performance and sound synthesis. So, in historically, computer music people have worked really hard on synthesizing individual notes with this idea that you could make a note, then you could just make melodies by putting multiple notes together. And that's that's been the dominant model uh, for you know for 60 years. And uh, it's the model that we see in MIDI and the keyboard synthesizers. You know, every time you push a key, you get a new note. And you just, the notes might be recording samples, and you just put them together. And the only thing, I mean, that's a great model in an engineering sense. We've been able to build lots and lots of systems. The only problem with the model is it doesn't work. And so uh, what I have been working on is what you might call phrase-based synthesis. So with a trumpet, you know, it's not so much that you play a note and then you think about it and you play another note and you think about it. No, you, you play an entire line and as you're, as you're playing that line, you're, you're playing a phrase and the, the note articulations and everything else that goes on is just is part of this much bigger unit. And context really matters a lot. So for example, here are two different notes, same notes, same duration, same everything, except that one is uh, articulated with the tongue, so we call those tongue to notes, so it's like ta 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 ta. And the, the other one is a slurred note, so it would be like ta. And uh, they not only sound different, but if you analyze the amplitude of the note and, and plot the amplitude as a function of time, you see that the shapes are, are you know, really different. So the idea that you could just model one trumpet note out of context and play them and put them together. It's just really flawed. Here's an example of what that sounds like. So we take just individual notes, which individually these are actually pretty good notes, but you put them together and to me it doesn't even sound like a trumpet. On the other hand, if you uh, build a, a model that incorporates context and phrasing, note length, and a whole lot of other things. This is a computer synthesized trumpet. So to me, that sounds a lot more like a, a trumpet. 
And uh, more recently, and so this last summer, Ming finally finished her, her thesis, which was on uh, automating this process. So she built what I would call, I like to call a synthesizer synthesizer. So what you do is you, uh, you get recordings of instruments and what they play, and you throw it into this black box, and uh, out comes a synthesizer. So we're synthesizing the synthesizer. And then you take the output, and you put new music into it, and it plays it in the same style or the same manner as uh, these examples that you recorded. So here's a, a trumpet synthesizer that's been synthesized by Ming's example. And it's playing music that it's never seen before. Exactly the same program, uh, instead of putting in trumpet music, we put in bassoon music, and then we synthesize some bassoon music. <laughs> So uh, there's also improvisation at many different levels. You know, there's not only jazz improvisation where the focus is on very skilled improvisation, but there's also uh, you know even even a folk guitar player playing a traditional song is going to improvise probably chord voicings and strumming patterns, uh, maybe some rhythm, vocal rhythms. So improvisation at all different levels. Sound production is important if you want computers to uh, play with, with humans, and humans, humans like to play good sounding instruments. They work hard on that, and so you know, we have the sound production problem. 
There are computer science and software engineering issues of building real-time systems. You know, one, one thing I, analogy is uh, a rock band can go into a club and show up with amplifiers and electric instruments and chords and mixers and microphones. And they just plug everything together and everything works. And musicians know how to do this. And, uh, and it's not that hard because everything is very modular and designed to work together. Uh, you know, XLR cables go from line inputs to line outputs or mic inputs to mic outputs. And so we should be building software like this so that, I mean, I'm envisioning a future where you not only walk into a club and, and set up a sound system, but you set up you know, your automatic computer musician uh, with a bunch of modules for, for, uh, for listening, for synchronization, for sound production, and so on. Uh, so is there a market for this? Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's a pretty big market. There's, in, in the United States, there's $8 billion spent every year on music sales. And that's excluding recordings, education, and performances. So there's another $10 billion spent on performances and another $10 billion spent on recordings. Um, it may or may not be relevant to this. But also, approximately half of all U.S. households have a practicing musician. So, roughly, we could say there's there's probably ten plus billion dollars uh, and a hundred million people that might be interested in this. And, uh, so I think that's uh, numbers are, and numbers worldwide obviously are much bigger. Uh, one thing that I've done, kind of going in the, in this direction of taking state of the art uh, computer music uh, listening and processing and interaction and pushing it out into popular music in the mass market is a thing called Rock Prodigy. So this is a, a company, not a university research effort. And uh, you could describe it as Guitar Hero for real guitars. And I think what I want to do is just jump to a, a video. This one. I'm starting to call well with Macro. If you're having trouble learning the guitar, there may be a new iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch app for you. This is Rock Prodigy. Rock Prodigy is a bit like Guitar Hero, except we're using an actual guitar. It uses a tablature system, and it's a free download from the App Store. It's available today. You can download fully mastered original recordings for $2.99 a song, and learn how to play starting in easy mode and inching your way on up to Prodigy. Currently, there are about 30 songs available for in-app purchase, with more coming every day. You can play Metallica, Leonard Skinner, Allman Brothers Band, Paramore, and even more. In the app, you can choose from performance or practice mode. In practice mode, you can pause the song so you can rewind and practice the section over again. You can set it so it goes one note at a time so you can really break it down. You can even turn on chord names and note names so you can learn exactly what note you're playing while you're playing, say, fret three on string five. In performance mode, you're just rocking out to the song. The best part of the app is that it uses polyphonic pitch detection, which means while I can play it using you know, my electric guitar plugged in using an iRig or some other compatible device into the iPad so that it can record my notes, I can also just play my acoustic guitar and it will be recorded using the onboard mic to tell me if I'm playing the right note or if it's not quite right. Okay, so let me go back. So I, I really love this video because she said the best part is the polyphonic pitch recognition. So that's the that was my job in, <laughs> in this project. Uh, so all the all the interface and product concept and stuff was, was done by uh, other guys. But um, okay, so anyway, so that's that's something that's out there. Uh, I want to show you another thing. This is um, kind of uh, uh, a, a big version of the idea of having uh, a nearly autonomous computer musician 
playing with live musicians. So this is a jazz ensemble at Carnegie Mellon with a 20-piece string section where all the strings are being played by computer and if you see the speaker, the speaker array at the back of the orchestra, that's the, the string section. So we're starting, there is actually an acoustic bass here, but the high strings you hear are the computer. I can play some more stuff if people want to hear it, but I think I should, I should wrap up. Uh, so I think music understanding and human-computer music performance will enrich experiences for millions of people, including both amateurs and professionals. That's, that's my goal and my prediction. 
And on top of that, I think if we can build systems that many people uh, can actually use, even if they're doing uh, kind of current common practice music, there will always be a few people with wild ideas that will take this in new directions. And uh, even you know, new genres will emerge, and a new kind of music practice will emerge. And, and I think that's the interesting future for music performance. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Roger, for our absorbing talk. Do we have any questions on the audience? Where to start? Um, <coughs> have you considered it? Shun the band leader made me wonder whether you're considering some visual watching the band leader to conduct the the performers. Uh, yeah, wait, so are you talking about having the computer watch the... Having the computer watch the band leader and use the band leader to control the robotic performer. Yeah. Um, yes, and there is uh, some, some work done on conducting uh, various kinds of interfaces, camera-based interfaces, accelerometer-based interfaces. It turns out that uh, following a human conductor well, human conductors don't spend a lot of time actually conveying the beat very precisely. So a lot of synchronization is, is based on, on listening. And what the conductor spends a lot of time doing is reminding people of what they did in rehearsal. It's, it's very complicated. Uh, but it is possible to do that. One thing, I, I've kind of shied away from it because I think if you're, uh, well, in that case, there was a conductor. But in most cases, if, you're, if you need to bring in another person to kind of babysit the computer and conduct the computer, then it's no longer really autonomous. And maybe that person could just be a skilled keyboard player and, and play an instrument. You don't really need an independent, autonomous computer player. Mm -hmm. At least that's how I'm looking at it. Now. I was thinking of it as essentially a learning tool for conductors or a oh. self-performance or for, for the conductor who is kind of listening to these different Yeah, different yeah, and I, I, think, I think there's, um, I've talked to a couple of people at Carnegie Mellon that teach conducting, and there, there is a lot of interest out there in um, systems that can teach, uh, help, help teach conducting. And it's interesting, different conducting teachers have different ideas about what they should do. So one, one person thought just, you know, learning basic uh, conducting motion um, would be a good thing to have a computer do. And another person said, no, I don't care about that at all. What I want to do is I want to, um, I want systems where, um, you know, the entire woodwind section doesn't come in unless you give them the cue. Because when people are learning to conduct, they, you know, if you're conducting along with a recording, everybody always comes in. So you don't, don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Uh, sure. We talked about uh, the uh, you know, robotic accompanists or you know, welcome a bass player for your band. Have you considered finding code individual styles? Like, I'll include with Buddy Rich as my drummer, or Hans Peterson as my bassist today, but actually now, now I want Neil Peart as my drummer. And, you know, you oh, about yeah, yeah. Personalizing those things? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, I don't know how to do that, but um, that's kind of a natural step. Uh, that you know, once you have these systems and they actually work, then you then you have to start thinking about okay, where does content come from? And if you have to download a bass player, that probably means you can't play bass, and you probably don't either. You don't know how, or you really don't want to spend the time programming in every bass note and figuring out how to go from chord symbols to uh, to a cool bass line. I'd rather just say I wanted to sound like Jocko or, or something. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is great. We, anyone else, uh, please jump in. But, yeah. is it, getting back to, to the company, like, does it does it follow? Does it stop? One, I'm not certain how much is done. So, the drums sometimes, and the thing you do as a drummer, if the other people are speeding up or something down, you can go along with them and support what they're doing, or you can try to pull them back. Have you considered having the company kind of take an active role in trying to? to make things happen the way the company thinks they ought to, as opposed to... 
Yeah, I, I, I don't, don't mean. There's, uh, there's still research going on about how do musicians actually entrain tempo, how do they play together and manage that. It's, it's very poorly understood. And uh, so one thing, one thing that I've done that, that's a little interesting is if you take two of these accompaniment programs and you have them accompany each other, then um, at least the way I used to design systems, they would tend to, to run away because if you have just like a, if one leads by a millisecond, the other is always going to try to catch up and they'll just go faster and faster. Um, so, so you might. Yeah, yeah. And, and so you might want to want to say, I build in some knowledge of, okay, what is the nominal tempo? And, and maybe we should all kind of go towards this nominal tempo. Um, yeah, so there, there are a lot of questions like that, and, and I don't think anyone really understands how to do it. Can I just <coughs> follow up with something a little bit related to that, I think, which is the, the element of the, the autonomous system having to predict what the human performer is going to be doing in order to make the adjustment <coughs> ahead of time, if you like. I was thinking particularly when you were talking about the strings and one of these recent uh, things, uh, talking about how you had to stretch the, the string notes uh, you know, uh, now, uh, so I was just thinking, if uh, the strings are accompanying a performer, and the performer decides to do a bit of rubato and slows down, uh, how easy is it to? I mean, how do you do that? Do Do you have some kind of uh, learned style thing where the computer actually knows that that's likely to happen? Because otherwise, you know, you get to the uh, decay transient of the, of the sound, and yeah. then there's a gap because oh, I didn't think he was going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so um, there are kind of a lot of questions wrapped up in there, but uh, first of all, uh, if you're doing computer accompaniment, one thing you can do is um, sort of pre-program uh, tempo changes into the piece. So what, what you do at performance time, I mean, imagine that you have, you have just a flat mechanical representation where the tempo is completely invariant. So the first thing you do is you kind of warp that into something that incorporates nominal expected tempo variation. Okay, so then in performance time, you're sort of warping that again, second time to make slight adjustments for what actually happens in the performance. So if you do that, then, then you only, hopefully you only have minor things to deal with. Uh, but then when you have to deal with them, when you do have to deal with them, um, one thing is, yeah, there, there has to be anticipation in the program, uh, and, and programs have the same problems that human accompanists do. Like, human accompanists always have problems uh, accompanying someone that's slowing down, because by the time you know that they're slowing down, you've already played in time, and only later do you realize that you played too early, and, and so, you know, you just have to let it go and, and then slow down. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can actually pick that up quite quickly, can't you? And, and you know, if you've got a phrase, you can hear after a couple of notes, oh, yeah. this guy's slowing down, and yeah. so you slow down as well. So, again, that's a kind of instant uh, reaction. <clears throat> yeah, you so you, you, can, you can react, and, and um, uh, usually when, when performers are speeding up, then, you know, it's a better case because when they when they speed up, as soon as they play a note early, you know immediately that oh, I should play my note. And so you sort of you can do that. And now it's a little bit harder. I mean, you can do that if you're actually synthesizing uh, things. If you're time stretching audio, then there's some limits to you know how far how far you know how fast you can jump around in the audio recording. And so one one advantage that we have with uh, the work that I'm doing now in what, what I call popular music, but the, the, it's kind of a, a code word for music with steady beats, so or steady tempo, nominally steady tempo. So in, in that, so, you know, again, that's rock music, folk music, jazz music, but not classical chamber music uh, for the most part. But if the tempo is more or less steady, then you, you can do a much better job of predicting where the beat is going to be 
And the downside is you have to predict that where that beat's going to be much more accurately because you get into these rhythmic grooves where 10 or 20 milliseconds, you know, you can push push ahead by 20 milliseconds or back by 20 milliseconds and really completely changes the rhythmic feel of, of the music. And so, so you have to be much more aware of rhythm, but you have an opportunity to actually achieve that because it's so predictable. Yeah. Hi. Um, how how close do you think we are, or are we already at the point where a system can learn how you? So if I use your software to play with the companies, can it learn how I tend to do something? Can it learn my style, my sort of when? So does it come to me? Do I come to it fresh every time, or can it learn how I'm likely to do something? Because that's really interesting um, in terms of um, our musician. So I'd, I'd be more interested in in, in a system that knows how I'm going to improvise or knows what I'm going to play. So yeah, are we, are, yeah. we, are we close to that, or is that? I I think we're not so close to that. Right. Uh, the problem with with doing, you know, when you start. Actually, maybe maybe we can do uh, surprisingly good predictions. But if you're you know if you're missing even ten percent of the time, and, and if you're basing decisions on your predictions and you're wrong ten percent of the time, and it really makes a difference, then you know then, then musically that's that's a problem. Uh, music is really demanding. I used to play with a guy. It was, it was so funny. He would. He would always um, he'd, he'd watch the football games on the weekends, and then he'd, he'd, and, and after the game there'd be these interviews. Uh, but, I mean, let's say it's a, a baseball game. I guess I don't know if you do. You know, you don't, I don't know if anyone knows baseball, but but in, in baseball you try to you, you swing the bat at this ball and you try to hit it, and 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 really good players hit it about thirty percent of the time, or actually get a run thirty percent of the time. And so after after the uh, after the game, you know, they interview people, and the guy says, "I have a, I had a pretty good game," and and my my friend, the, the professional trombone player, was saying, "Do you know what would happen to me if I hit thirty percent of the notes?" <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you mean you had a good game? That was pathetic. <laughs> so, so um, you know, music is very demanding, and, and if you if you make predictions that are wrong and you act on them and you make you know real musical mistakes, then, then it's just not acceptable. So, but is that something that would just is just be a sh Sheer weight of time spent would it just be like a massive memory and massive data. Well, or that that can help. I mean, one of the problems with uh, machine learning. I mean, we know machine learning uh, uh, allows us to do incredible things if we have massive amounts of data. Um, we don't usually have a whole lot of music data. Like, I mean, you. You can you can pick up a book that has transcriptions of every note that Charlie Parker played. You know you can't go out and mine, data mine millions of songs because he didn't perform a million times, uh, and and so uh, you know if you're looking at hundreds of pieces and thousands of notes as opposed to millions, that's pretty limited for for learning in in you know current state of the art. But I think what humans do is we spend a lifetime listening to music of all different genres, and somehow we're able to sort it all out. And we don't, when we're listening to a, a jazz soloist, we don't have nearly the expectations that we have when we're listening to a tabla player. But somehow I think everything informs everything else. And also I think musicians have a real strong sense of what's musically good or musically permissible or musically you know, in style. So even if we make predictions about what someone's going to do, uh, you know, what we play is sort of constrained by these musical rules that we just haven't figured out how to encode those in, as computer behaviors yet. There's a lot of, a lot of interesting challenges. One, one thing I could, I could point to that's been really interesting, and I haven't looked at it too carefully, but uh, Apple Logic, the uh, audio workstation software, uh, the, the latest version came out with a bunch of what, uh, drummers. I mean, not just, not just simple drum machines, but they're actually uh, uh, sort of virtual drummers. So you can, you can pick different styles of drummers 
and um, uh, they have parameters that you can adjust, and and so they they allow you to you know add drum tracks to songs that are kind of musically stylistically plausible, but they're not just repeating a, a simple drum loop, they're generating stuff, and they're doing it parametrically with with a whole bunch of you know, a whole bunch of different styles and then parameter changes within those styles. So, so that's, you know, I thought that was pretty amazing to, that came out as, and actually in product form, because there's, there's not a lot of research in that area to, to base that on. Yeah. And your, um, my detail, and, and the um, phrase space, is this, assume that wasn't online, you have to look at the whole phrase in order to, you know, uh, yeah, you, all of the work we've done, you, you, yeah, you have full look ahead. Um, in practice, we don't actually look that far ahead. And there, there's a related system called Sinful, spelled S-Y-N, like in synthesis, uh, Sinful. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, they're using some techniques that are at least related to what I'm doing, they're, they're taking, uh, synthesizing notes in context, and uh, simple is actually real time, or sort of real time, you can play it from a keyboard, and it has a certain amount of latency, and if you extend the latency, I believe it's supposed to work a little bit better, but even if the latency is as low as maybe 50 or 100 milliseconds, just knowing if you're connecting to a note or, or not, and, and if you're making uh, transition a, a, a big pitch leap upwards or downwards as opposed to a small leap, things like that. Um, e even if you only have 50 milliseconds to uh, to do something differently, that you know what happens in those 50 milliseconds makes a really big difference. Yeah. So I'm interested in your by your remark about what happens when you put put two of these things feeding to each other. Yeah. Um, because I can imagine that there's a problem about... I have two questions. One is that I can imagine that you could have a system that was over-eager and would have that effect on human beings. It would sort of drive them too hard. Mm -hmm. um, it, also seems, it also seems as though if that happens with two of the systems and it doesn't happen with a person and then one system, they must be different in some way. Yeah. So one of them must be eager than eager than the other. The, the person must be more reluctant to comply than the program. Can you comment on yeah, that yeah. problem and how you solved it? Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. So uh, uh, yes, there uh, humans have to be different from these these computer models that don't have any notion of what the tempo should be because when they play together they can play a steady tempo. And that's because humans can uh, assume a leadership position in the music and establish the tempo and, and know that you know, they're going to be followed. And that's typically what, uh, what you do as a soloist. So the fact that the computer, if, if you're in this kind of traditional soloist and accompanist model, uh, you probably want the accompanist to do whatever the soloist does. And so you know, we can get away with it. Um, but if you want to flip the roles, then, then you have to make the, the soloist, I think, more assertive. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, and then you ask about uh, what happens if you uh, tell the accompanist to always rush, <laughs> and then you let a soloist play with that. And I've, I've done that with my programs, and uh, uh, if, if, if you're only talking about a few milliseconds, then you don't really hear it, and it just goes away. But I, I have tried things where, where I tried to make the, I, I could tell the accompanist always play a tenth of a second ahead of the human. And when I play with that system, my heart rate goes up, I start feeling <laughs> adrenaline. It is, it, it's amazingly powerful what, what that can do to you emotionally to, to be behind and you, and, you, and you do try to play faster, but you can never play fast enough. <laughs> and you know that it's wrong to really play a lot faster. And yet, uh, so it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a great experience. I don't, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a kind of torture, really. 
Uh, yeah. One more question, or uh, yeah, there there was some in, yeah. in the back. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, just a quick question. Uh, for local forces, uh, do you have like a hierarchical representation of that, or do they have uh, do the the uh, basic modules have um, or musical semantics for, for some of the motives or themes or tributes kind of stuff? So in I'm, I'm sorry in in, the in, in which case uh, you were suggesting to use forces instead of oh yeah yeah. To, yeah so so um, I I wouldn't say it's a real hierarchical model but there are rules that apply at different levels so. Uh, uh, for example, I mean, so there are some things that, that in the model that are within the note, there are some things within the model that deal with uh, transitions between notes, and there's some things in the model that deal with uh, kind of what like, effects at the overall level. So yeah, I, I guess that's a, it, it, so it is hard. you do have musical semantics? Well, I, I mean, I'm not sure what, what music semantics means well, in this. Well, actually, one of the aspects, how, how did you Dig up all the features which you use in your research, for example. Do you dig them out from like uh, the like some sort of rules of music compositions, like a harmonic progression, all that kind of Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so we um, um, in in the in the work that we've done so far, we're actually using phrase markings in the score. So, so uh, I mean. You know, we know where notes are, we know where no transitions are, we know where phrase markings are. So essentially, the, the hierarchy that we use is, is given to us in the music notation. Uh, and, and we go with that. So we don't have any models for like parsing music uh, to, to develop a hierarchy from, let's say, just a, a simple list of notes. And, and other people have worked on that problem, and, and you know, I'm not, it's not really a solved problem. I would say there are probably some some things that work good enough that you could you know you could probably take advantage of it. I think we'll uh, thank our uh, Roger again and ask him questions after. <laughs>